This video only covers the TV show and its creator, so spoilers for season 1 and half of season 2, but no comic spoilers. The iceberg was made during the season 2 break, so if something got changed or revealed, unlucky. You're fighting so you can watch everyone around you die! Think, Mark! This is the most famous scene from the hit superhero show Invincible. This moment in particular went incredibly viral and was memed across the entire internet. And that's why it's the first entry. The iceberg will cover well-known facts through things you can only find out by paying attention to the show, to stuff you can hardly notice by just watching, and some shocking secrets. The show's other extremely recognizable feature is the animation. The colorful style, which was heavily inspired by early 2000s superhero cartoons, stands out because no other show does that. That doesn't mean it's particularly good though. In fact, it's very simplistic, but it does what it needs to do. Despite some rough moments, the animation is mainly there to deliver the story, not stand out on its own. Invincible, just like fucking everything at this point, made it into Fortnite, with Mark, Nolan and Eve getting added. They each also got their own signature cosmetics. I unironically paid 28 euro for this, but hey, I can Omni-Man greedy. The show was made by Amazon and is available on Prime Video. It premiered on the 25th of March 2021, with 8 episodes coming out weekly. It has been renewed for 2 more seasons. It's based on a comic written by Robert Kirkman, which had 144 issues come out between 2003 and 2018. It was the author's first widely successful comic. His other successful comic is this indie release you might have heard of, The Walking Dead, which also apparently has a show, and yes, it's also in Fortnite. Invincible isn't a classic superhero show as everything but the character designs differs from the norm. The action is still there even if way more gory but the show puts a lot of focus on the emotional journey of the characters. It tackles everything from family drama, growing up, loss and even isn't afraid to shed the light on some smaller characters. Omni-Man is Evil refers to the big twist and the most important moment of the entire first season, him killing the Guardians of the Globe and so weakening the Earth to be taken over. The famous killing spree is so important because it hooks the viewer to get interested into the mystery and through that, the show itself. Another thing the show does wonderfully is hire voice actors. It features an incredible roster, which includes, but is not limited to, J.K. Simmons, Mark Hamill, Seth Rogen, Steven Yeun, Lauren Cohen, and so on. Not only were the main characters added in Fortnite, the trio also made it into Fall Guys, while Omni-Man was added to Mortal Kombat. I can finally kick someone's ass pretending I'm a space psychopath. Speaking of Omni-Man, my guy is thick. Like, dude is caked. He might kill thousands of people, but he would still be a munch. Moving on to the next layer, we've got things that you can easily observe from watching the show, but are still interesting. A major topic in the second season, actually more of just an episode 1 so far, are multiverses. When I first heard about this, I was really disappointed, as there is a multiverse fatigue going on in cinema, but hopefully Invincible can handle the topic in a fresh way. The concept has been present in comic books for a while now, plus it's mostly a lack of quality multiverse stories rather than the overuse of the concept. Thanks Marvel for making us fatigued. The next point refers to the fact that season 2 of the show is split into two parts. This is a common thing to happen in animation, but the season took 2 years to make and it only has 8 episodes, which starts to make a bit less sense. There is a bit of a mystery surrounding the actual reason, but it's most likely to allow the people of the show to finish some things up. Kirkman also stated that the break is there to give fans more time to process the events, but that's most likely copium. During the break between the first and the second season, Adam Eve received her standalone episode, covering her backstory and diving deeper into her as a person. It was definitely needed if she's to be one of the main characters. Omni-Man told his son that his mother Debbie is more of a pet to him as anything else, all while she was sitting front row to witness all this. It's a big reason as to why she's so traumatized now. I included this because there's a lot more to it from Omni-Man's perspective, but more on this later. Another, not very nice thing, are Sinclair's robots. The guy from the trade offer meme was discovered kidnapping college kids and brainwashing them into serving him as fighter robots. After successfully shutting down the operation, Cecil still kept him around, despite these robots being very unethical. It tells a lot about Cecil's character, mainly that for him, the ends do justify the means. 
One of the most welcome changes in the second season was Amber and how she got way less annoying. She really made a comeback from being one of the most hated characters on current television to being a loving and understanding girlfriend. I don't know if this is justified further than just the showrunners didn't want to have such a hated character. But hey, as long as she isn't such a bitch, I'm down. Duplicate and Monster Girl are two of the members of the current Guardians of the Globe roster. Their superpowers come with a disadvantage as Duplicate feels everything that her clones feel, meaning that if they die, she feels the pain as well. On the other hand, Monster Girl gets a bit younger every time she uses her powers. That's why she appears about 14 while chronologically being about 24. Another small but obvious detail is that the title cards always lead up to something. In season 1, there was more and more blood every time, hinting at a big and bloody finale. Now in season 2, the title card is cracking and we're really in a new color scheme, but yeah, spoilers and stuff. Finishing the third tier with a banger, Mark wanks. That's right, before he got with Amber and when they got into a fight, Mark was making his snake. This is evident by the loop and tissues being on his desk, but them not being there when he's in a relationship. A more important park detail starts off the fourth tier, which is that the first costume Mark tried and decided not to use was later given to Bulletproof. Let's just say Mark made the right choice not picking the first suit he was given. Chicken Pot Pie Thursday is quite self-explanatory as every Thursday prisoners get Chicken Pot Pie. The line was delivered by the Moller twins and turned into a meme. Uh, Thursday. Chicken pot pie. With there even being one of those automated Twitter accounts that posts the scene every Thursday. Viltrumites are extremely durable. The atoms in a Viltrumite's body are different to the ones us humans have. This makes them more durable, which you can see in Season 2, Episode 4, as they fight for quite a while. But even more, when Lucan still makes a stand, despite his guts hanging out. They also heal way better, that's why Mark can recover from all these beatings. Still the most painful moment in the show. When I first mentioned this meme, I referred to it as Think Mark, Think, which is how it's known on the internet. But this is a classic case of the Mandela effect, as the actual line is simply Think Mark, without the second thing. The next point refers to one of the most interesting details of season 2, as when Mark visits the Midnight City, he flies by two skeletons hanging by their hands. These two were left behind by Darkwing, who told them that he will pick them up the next day after getting called in the Guardians HQ, but that they never came because of And so, they were left there to die. Kinda cruel, bruh. Two Punch Man, yes this is real, refers to a background character who was seen auditioning for the new Guardians of the Globe. Sadly, he didn't get in, but Kirkman did confirm that this was in fact a parody character, not the famous anime protagonist One Punch Man. Moving on to the fifth year, where we start off with another interesting background character. This one was paced lower because it has more importance other than just being a throwaway joke. Plus, it's completely possible that he makes an appearance at some point. It's Duplicate's twin brother, Multipol. These names are getting ridiculous. I don't know if it works explained in the comics, but as far as we know, he was imprisoned and isn't very happy with it. How to Kill Immortal refers to the fact that the only way to kill the hero is to separate his head from the body, which is exactly why Omni-Man always decapitates him. But his attacker has to make sure to, you know, if they want him out for good. Following the release of the 4th episode of the 2nd season, many fans complained that the episode's pacing didn't work for them as cutting away from a grand moment like Mark and Nolan's fight to fucking Donald having an existential crisis feels too drastic of a change. With the limited amount of episodes to develop so many characters, hopefully they can strike a good balance between focusing on many characters but not taking away from the main storyline or even worse, a major event. Going back to something more visual, the yellow part of Invincible's costume forms an eye, which is a nod to the superhero's name, but also the comics publishing company, Image Comics. It was founded by comic book veterans who wanted to move away from Marvel and DC's constant control and influence over creative decisions. Despite Kirkman not being a founding member, he is now the chief operating officer. I mentioned these two entries ago, but Donald is having an existential crisis because despite appearing human, he's a cyborg. Viewers acted a lot like Debbie 
as we saw him die in season 1, just to randomly appear again. The reason this is so low on the list is because we don't yet know how and why he's a cyborg, or even how many Donalds have died before him, but it will probably be moved up if we get an explanation, which I imagine we will after he gets so much screen time in the most important episode of season 2 so far. Flash, <coughs> sorry, Red Rush doesn't only have super speed but also super strength, at least when it comes to punches. I'm mentioning this because it's a nice detail in the fight with Omni-Man, as he not only does quite some damage to him, but also breaks his wrists doing so. Too bad he gets, you know. The last entry in this tier refers to the Invincible live-action movie, where the bad adaptation already started spreading in 2017, with Seth Rogen and even Goldberg set to write and direct, with of course the involvement of Kirkman. Unfortunately, the updates have since been few and far between. The movie took a lot of time to be written and faced even more delays due to strikes, meaning that it's most likely still in the development stage. I'm just glad they're taking their time to really fulfill their vision, because fans can always wait a little longer, but they have a much harder time watching a bad product. Hopefully, the burden of making a show at the same time and bringing comic book action into real life isn't too much. Now, we've arrived at the depths of the iceberg, where only the most hidden secrets lie. Like for example, these fuckers look the same as the DC guys. The reason for this is actually why they are so low on the list. As already mentioned, Kirkman is part of Image Comics, who rebel against the corporate norm in the comic industry. That's why he made the original Guardians similar to traditional superheroes, and they'll kill them off to symbolize that this comic is different. It's a rebellious statement against big companies and their attitude toward authors and artists. Another thing about the creation of the show is the fact that some things were changed from the comics. There were obviously small adjustments like modernizing the technology, but also major ones like making Amber black or making Debbie half Korean. The changes are done seamlessly though and it's great that more people can feel represented in the adaptation. Viltrumites are similar to humans. The two species aren't only similar in their looks, but also genetics, as they are believed to even have a common ancestor. This is visible through the fact that Nolan and Debbie's DNA is very compatible, as Mark is, you know, normal. The last point in the tier refers to something comic readers might be more familiar with. Mark's teacher David was strapping bombs to students and letting them explode to take revenge against those that spent too much time at the mall, parties, drinking alcohol and play sports when they should be studying and doing homework. Okay. He also tried killing even Mark who successfully stopped the professor by throwing him in the sky right before he exploded. The story didn't fully make it into the show, but there is a reference to it playing on the TV in the back of a scene. Dad! Hence, the inclusion on the iceberg. And just like that, we're down to the last two horrifying secrets. Omni-Man is right. After killing the Guardians, calling his wife a pet, and almost killing his son, how could anyone say that he was right? Well, we have to take a look at it from Nolan's perspective. Veltrumites have a lifespan of about a thousand years, which is hard for us humans to process, but what that means is that his perception of time becomes way different than ours. The relationship with his family had so little meaning for him, because he probably had and will have many more of them. With him seeing and experiencing so much, it's only natural that he becomes so emotionless. For a human, each relationship would have to last about two years in order to experience as much as he has. And that's why he calls Debbie a pet. Her life, compared to him, is like owning a hamster. You have one for about two years, and despite getting attached to it, you eventually just get a new hamster and forget about the old one. It definitely doesn't help that he was raised an emotionless warrior with no space for empathy. The other big claim is that Kirkman is a fraud. It all began in an interview when he was asked this question. And secondly, as an aspiring writer and comic book writer, how do I go about getting an illustrator? Uh, trickery and deceit. The answer might have hit too close for home for some people, as just weeks later his childhood friend Tony Moore sued him over the rights to The Walking Dead. See, Moore and Kirkman created the series together, but because Moore couldn't keep up with the monthly release date, he decided to sign his rights over to Kirkman. With monetary compensation, he didn't just give him the thing. Seven years after the departure, he claimed that Kirkman is a proud liar and misrepresented facts, which is what led him to his success. 
Kirkman was being accused of some serious things, but his response was rock solid. Everything that had happened was completely legit, with both parties legally agreeing that this is the way the franchise will continue. It feels bad for Moore, as he missed out on quite a success when abandoning the comic, but the decision was at the time the best for both parties. And so, this point just refers to the accusations, which means that Kirkman most likely isn't what the lawsuit claims. And so, we've reached the end of the iceberg. Let me know in the comments if I missed something or if you would change any entries. Just leave a spoiler alert if needed. I left links in the descriptions to videos that were a huge help for making this, so please consider checking them out or just watch the video YouTube just recommended to you. And thanks for watching and goodbye. Let me break it down for you, Mark. You know what frauding is? It's when two men stack their dicks on top of each other.